Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. And Lord, you never leave us nor forsake us. It's we that leave you, Lord. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that tonight that we may decrease, that you may increase in our life, in this place. Father, as we live in a world filled with hate, filled with death, filled with anger. And Lord, you tell us in your word, by this, they will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. And as, and I, as I think about this time that we live in, the world we live in, Father, we want to thank you for the Holy Spirit that you give to us to help us as believers to be salt, to be light in this very dark world, Lord. Where oftentimes, Lord, even the flesh creeps into our lives and we need to remember who we are in Christ. The new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. We are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us the strength. So tonight, Lord, we can be conquerors through your word. Father, that our hearts will be open to hear from you, Lord, as we look, Lord, at Judges chapter 10 today. And we see, Lord, even in a dark time in Israel, how you used two men to bring your righteousness amongst your people. In that little bleep of time, that little bleep in history, Lord, and Lord, even as we think about our time today, we're just a bleep in your radar. We're just, for such a time like this, you put us here for such a time, Lord, before we know it, we're going to be gone. We're going to be with you forever, for all eternity. Lord, we need your help. We need your help, Lord. To live as you call us to live. And Lord, that you would help us tonight through your word. And you fill us with your spirit. Father, that as we look at the glass, that we always see it full, Lord, regardless of the situation. And as we think about our lives, that we can know that. That we are full in Christ. That overflowing, Lord, can take place through our lives. Of your spirit, of your love. That others may partake of it, Lord. And, and come and taste and see that you are good. We give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Go ahead. Uh, let's be seated, please. It's great to be here with you guys tonight by the grace of God. If you can open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. Tonight we're going to be looking at some unknown men who made a difference. Who made a difference in a little blink of history that God has put them in. Today, as we continue our study of the judges of Israel in this dark period of time for them, we are going to consider the lives and ministries of these two minor judges. Today, we will examine the lives of Tula and Jair. And while the Bible has very little to say about these two individuals, five verses dedicated, actually, I would say two verses to one and three verses to the other. Very little dedicated to them. These two men and these men in their lives and the deeds, they have much to teach us. And we're going to spend tonight looking at these five verses and these two men and their lives. I want us to learn the truth that you do not have to be well known to make a difference for the glory of God. Amen. You don't have to be always in the limelight, right? You can be a root. You can be a root to the, to, to the tree that bears fruit. I want you to see that God delights in using the unknown. Those that, I would say, would play the background. The unknown servant to help his people glorify his name and build his kingdom and build his church. I want you to see that God can and will use you if you will make yourself available to Him. One of my famous quotes is, God is not looking for ability, but God is looking for availability. Amen? Let's examine the lives of these two unknown men, but yet made such a difference. Consider with me the principles that are revealed in these lives of these unknown men. Let's go and look here at 
I would say, their inheritance that they inherited as they come upon the scene. We remember with me last week, as we looked at Abimelech, right? What did Abimelech do? Nothing good, right? He actually created a very big mess. I would say, as we look at these two individual, individuals' lives, they were handed a ball, a yarn, and a knot to, in a sense, to undo what was given to them as an inheritance. Let's look here at verse 1 of chapter 10 of the book of Judges. And it says, After Abimelech there arose to save Israel Tula, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. How would you like to have a grandfather named Dodo? <laughs> Wonder where that word comes from, huh? He dwelt in Shimir in the mountain of Ephraim. And so what do we see here? Well, let us again take a moment to kind of look back at the sad story of the man we know as Abimelech. If you, if you missed last week, just real quick recap of who Abimelech was. Abimelech was the son of Gideon by his, by his concubine, Judges 8.31. And after his death of, the Gideon, of Gideon, Abimelech uh, basically determined within himself that he would be the ruler over Israel. And he started to undermine the people of, the, uh, of Shechem. So he convinced his mother's people to support him in his quest to become the king of Israel. So what did the men do? They were his people. They were his brothers. And so he says, hey, listen, would you rather have me lead you or would you rather have those others lead you? And those others were his stepbrothers. And so the people of Shechem, the men of Shechem, agreed among themselves to decide to help Abimelech. They gave him 70 pieces of silver. Using this money, Abimelech hired a group of thugs to help him to achieve his goal. And how? And what, what did he hire him to do? Unfortunately, again, the world we live in, the reality that we live in, as we look at the news and as we look around the world and we just see all the evil that the enemy just loves to wreak havoc upon the world, Abimelech did uh, nothing more than what evil men do. And he killed 69 of the 70 brothers that he had. 69 killed them all. He had these thugs do it. The youngest, a boy named uh, Jotham, escaped. After this, the men of Shechem declared Abimelech to be their king. And after he, he is his anointing, Abimelech ruled as, he ruled as king for three years. In the end, the men of Shechem, they turned their back on Abimelech themselves. And in the midst of an attack upon the walls, what happened? There was, a, there was a woman who threw a piece of millstone from the, the walls and hit Abimelech right straight in the head. Right? And we would call that a Holy Spirit head slap, but for him it was a millstone head slap, which in a sense killed him. But the reality was, as he was dying, because he was, he, he was just too proud to beg, he had one of his own men you know, basically turn the sword on himself because he didn't want to be killed by a woman. And so he had one of his own men thrust through. See, the Bible tells us, as we think about here these, these two men, by the time Abimelech is dead, the nation of Israel, as we come to this chapter, is left in various uh, tattered from civil war, military upheaval, you know, isn't the only problem the nation is facing. We read in uh, Judges chapter 8, verse 33 and 34, the Bible tells us that as soon as Gideon died, what happened to the people? The people of Israel, they turned their backs on God and they gave their worship to the Canaanites, to the Baals, to all the different other gods. And as a result, all these, these problems, the nation of Israel is in a mess this was the nation, the nation uh, inherited by Tula, as we're going to see tonight, and J uh, Jair. This is what they inherited. And I want to share with you tonight, we're going to see a couple, a couple principles with you here right now. And the reality is, guys, even as we look at the world, oftentimes we watch the news. And we, we as my daughter was able to, and my son today were able to go visit a morgue through the FLIP program, and it just it breaks your heart, some of the stories that they came home and shared, how these people died, 
And how through one father or through one uncle running over their nephew at a birthday party because he was drunk or whatever it may be or the father cutting his own baby's throat because she wouldn't stop crying at four months old. I mean, guys, this is the reality. This is stuff that's going on in our city. And as she's telling me these things, I'm, I'm like, my ear, my eyes are getting like teary-eyed because I'm thinking, this is the stuff that's going on in our community, Lord, and we are here. What are we doing to make a difference? And sometimes you can get overwhelmed and you can feel like, man, you know, is there anybody out there? And the Lord would say, yes, there is. Pastor Dan, simmer down. Don't worry. Be happy. You're not alone. You're not alone. God always has a remnant. He always has a remnant. As we look back in history, what is a remnant? The part of something that is left when other parts are gone. In Israel, things were bad. The nation is at war with itself. And the majority of the people are worshiping idols. Right? You look out and you say, is there any good in the world? In the midst of all that, God still has a faithful remnant. We see an example found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. And, and who do we see here? We see Elijah. And what's he doing? He's complaining. He's afraid for his life's sake. And he's, he's saying, hey, I'm the only one. Is there any other? Is there anything out there? Is there any, any other good? And, and yet in verse 18 it says, yet I have reserved 70,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal in every mouth that has not kissed him. See, when Elijah entered the valley of depression, he came to believe that he was the only person in the country that was living for God and doing right and yet God gave him the Holy Spirit head slap and says, Elijah, don't worry about it. I got your back. He soon found out that God had a remnant in Israel. Elijah is told that there is still 70,000 that had not bowed their knee to Baal. And tonight I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, as we look out in the very dark world, God still has remnant. Amen? Amen? He still has a remnant. In this day of increasing immorality, uh, rapid wickedness, God still has faithful people who love Him, who want to serve Him and live for Him. There are still people who have a prayer closet. There are still people who believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There are still people who love the church. Who love going to church. Amen? There are still people who tell a lost person or a lost world about Jesus. Every day. God is doing great things. There are still people who sing, shout, Testify and honor God. Amen? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. And there are still people who believe that. And who, I believe, you people right here today in this church, I believe that. There are people that truly believe that. And they allow that joy to be their strength. No matter what happens in their life. And while this remnant might not be in the majority, they are still here for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. Serving God is not always easy. Some of you would never know that because you haven't tried yet. <laughs> but I'm going to encourage you with this. Serving God is not always easy. But it is always right. It's the right thing to do. It must have you know, been difficult when you think about these two individuals here. Tula and, and Jair. As they dwell, they dwell in the problem left behind by Abimelech. <laughs> Right? What was their attitude like? What was their, you know, what was their mindset? As they dealt with idolatry of a nation, it was not easy. It was not an easy day of ministry. It was nothing easy about serving God in this time. It's easy when you can, you know, serve God and everybody's a Christian. But it wasn't easy for them. They had to undo all this, this that was created for them. But yet they what? Ministered anyway. 
They ministered anyway because it was the right thing to do. We can learn a lot from their examples. It's not always easy to walk in the old paths, the old paths when everyone around us is looking for something new, but it's the right thing to do. It isn't always easy to live for the Lord when others around you are living for the world. The flesh and the devil, but it is the right thing to do. It isn't always easy to do the right thing when others around you are acting in bad ways and influencing you, some of your best friends, some of the people you love the most, but it is the right thing. The fact is, we can make a choice to live for God. The Bible says, for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. And every day we got to make this choice. The day you made a choice to come to church. See, God gives us that free will to choose. Every day we got to make this choice. Even when everyone else seems to be going their own way and living for self, our duty, brothers and sisters, is not to look to them, but to Him, to Jesus Christ who perfectly ran his own race and will enable us to do what? To run our, our race as well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we are reminded, the Bible says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who, who, who are those cloud of witnesses? They're all those co-workers. They're our neighbors. They're all everybody that, as we walk into this world, that are watching our lives. And you may not even know who's watching you. But it's, it's like going to the Victoria Gardens Mall and just a, cl a cloud of people because we are surrounded by them every day. Let us then lay aside every weight and, and it says, and sin, which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And how do we do it? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Philippians 4.13, the Bible reminds us, and we should all know that one, right? I can do what? I can do all, and if you're from Texas, all y'all things, right, through Christ, who gives me the strength. See, I learned to realize that if I'm frustrated or if I'm bothered, then maybe I'm not doing it in strength. Maybe I'm, do, maybe I'm doing it in my strength. Right? We don't need to take it personal. If somebody rejects us from sharing the gospel, that's not our problem. It's their problem. You see that? When you're out there, the Bible says, don't grow weary while doing good. Why? Because you're going to reap the harvest in due season. We don't need to, put, to take it personal. We don't need to put it on our shoulders. You see, we can do all things through Christ because He gives us the strength. And in John 15, verses 4 and 5, the Bible also reminds us, and I love this one, because if we're abiding in Him, right, and I in you, then you do what? You bear much fruit. That's what He says. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear of itself, can bear fruit of itself, unless it what? Abides in the vine. Well, listen, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. Let's go repeat, guys. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in, I in him, what? Bears much fruit. For without me, Amen. You can do nothing. You can do nothing. Our world is in a mess. If you didn't already know that. Isn't it? We can lay the blame on pretty much anywhere we want. We can blame our, our president. We can blame... <laughs> we can blame our churches. Right? We can, blame our, we can blame one another. But at the end of the day, the blame 
rest right here. The blame is, you know, the people of God. The people of God are partially to blame for the condition of the world around us. We have ceased to do the right thing. We have ceased to stand for righteousness. We have ceased to say, no, I don't need that. It's not good for me. And we have stood by, silent, while the world has embraced evil. See, the reality is it comes down to two things. They just wanted more. It's, it's a lot easier to do evil than to stand for righteousness. It hurts sometimes to do good. You get stretched sometimes. You may feel like taffy sometimes for doing good. And it reminds me of, of Nehemiah chapter 4. When, as we look at Nehemiah chapter 4, it's a time where they're rebuilding the wall. They had a great big task ahead of them. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible says, And Judah said, The strength of the labors is failing, and there is such rub, so, so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. What do we see here? Well, the people, they were tired. They were tired. The strength of the labors is failing. <laughs> we're tired. Are you tired tonight? Is your strength failing tonight? Are you connected to the vine? Are you abiding in Him? Are you drawing your strength from Him? You see, for them, they were tired. Because as they look, not only as they labored, and as they look out at the building of the wall, there was just too much work for them to be done. And it can be overwhelming, can it? When you think about all the work there is to be done. When you think about all the lives. When you think about just our city, 210,000 people. And the majority of them don't know the Lord. It reminds me of, of another verse in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest what? Is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. You know, when Nehemiah says, Men, he says, We're tired, there's a lot of rubbish, there's a lot of work. It reminds you of almost a picture of the Twin Towers. You know, and after the Twin Towers fell, you, you know, you look around, it was just for miles, right? It was like, wow, how long is it going to take for them to clear this out? And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, we do it, what, one soul at a time. How do we turn the world right side up for Jesus? One life at a time. One person at a time. I call them starfishes, right? You just throw one starfish back in the ocean at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Right? That's how you do it. You know, we're coming up to a new year here pretty soon. Before we know it, I would say we're like a month and some days away, right? There's going to be, you know, a new vision for the church. Fresh vision. Fresh movement. But we're not done with the year. Today's a new day in Christ. Amen? Live in such a way as if Christ were coming back today. So do we see, as we look at the new year, are we going like, okay, I see the finish line. And I'm going to go and slow down because I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, I've been working hard all year. I've been serving the Lord all year. I've been doing a lot of great things all year. We're just going to go ahead. And I see the finish line. It's right there. And I'm going to go ahead and slow down. Or are we going to take it a step up? What are we going to do? We ain't done yet. We got great opportunities to do some great things for the Lord, right? And, and what are they? Well, we have... Thanksgiving, and, and we have right, Christmas, if not the biggest opportunity we have on Christmas. <coughs> you know, one of the things I like to do is, is you know, uh, giving, I would say, we want to give you Christmas. You know, do a rollout, you know, giving away Christmas. Have you ever thought about that? Giving away Christmas? Now, most of us are thinking about what am I giving for Christmas, huh? <laughs> 
How about we give away Christmas this year as a church? Right? We, that's what we're supposed to do. Right? Christmas, Christ, give away Christ. But we can give away Christmas too. That means we can give somebody else Christmas. Uh, an experience of Christmas. We'll work all that out. We'll, we'll, we'll give, it, give it more detail. But how would you guys like to give away Christmas this year? I would. Maybe pick a family that we can sponsor and just give away Christmas. You know where I learned that from? Believe it or not, for children's ministry to know this, I learned it from the veggie tale. Give away Christmas. <laughs> hey, administer it to me. <laughs> we had one of our one of our infants was watching it, veggie tale. And that's what it's about. Giving away Christmas. I thought, man, that's a great idea. God can speak to the veggie tales. <laughs> It's a great thing for this year's Christmas. Romans 13, verse 11 and 14, the Bible says this. And, and, and do this, knowing that the time, that now is what? High time to what? To awake, out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Isn't that good news, guys? Like we're one second closer to heaven. We're one second closer from seeing Jesus. Every single one of us. And we're going to be in heaven together for all eternity. And we're going to see each other in heaven. We're going to go, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. And the spirit, bro, like that? <laughs> Fabio. Someone's going to have hair. Someone's going to have the six pack we always wanted. <laughs> Well, I would just stop right there. <laughs> For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us say, cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in rivalry as in drunkenness. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. But put on, can we say that? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So it's time. It's time. It's time for the remnant of the Lord to stand up and to fight for the things we have left. Amen? For the things we have left. Why? It's a good fight, the Bible says. It's a good fight. And it's time to fight for the family. For the unborn child. For the home. For the church. For our community. Because brothers and sisters, apathy, we talked about that, right? If we continue to have apathy, if we continue to fail, if we fail to stand for what is important today, we should not complain. When it, it, is, uh, when it is taken from us tomorrow <coughs> because it will be regardless it will come knocking at your door you can either you can either deal with it overseas <laughs> or you can deal with it in your front yard either way because we don't stand now <laughs> we will stand we will stand we will have no other choice how are they doing now let's go ahead and look back here at our text, and let's go ahead and read the whole text as we came into our introduction. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tula, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir, in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel how long? 23 years. And he died and was buried in Shamir. After him arose Jair, a Gileadite. And he judged Israel how long? 22 years. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. They also had 30 towns, which are called Habath, Jair, to this day, which are in the land of Gilead, and Jair died and was buried in Come on, come on. So we see here the ministry 
that they performed. What was the ministry they performed? We have these two men, again, they did not lead any great military campaigns. They weren't like Nehemiah, right? They weren't like any of those judges. They might not have commanded great armies, but they may, they may not have, have left a large legacy of great spiritual achievements, but what they did accomplish deserves creditation. What they did, they still, what they did still challenges us today. These men helped maintain peace for how long? Nearly 50 years. Nearly 50 years in this time. Think about it. 50 years in a nation split apart by war, by deception, by rebellion, by pagan worship. That in itself is no small task. Something that as you read through, the, through these five verses, you may not even think about. When there were no attacks, from the outside, they help prevent the nation from being ripped apart from the inside. There was a ministry of peace in a time of turmoil. Something to acknowledge in these men. These men also helped to preserve the heritage of their nation. They ministered to the faithful remnant in Israel in a time when, when it was a fading remnant, needed constant leadership. Needed great leadership. Tula and Jire did in their day exactly what, what they were supposed to do, what we are supposed to do to be doing in our day. And what is that? They acted like the salt of the world. They acted like salt. And we're going we're gonna to look at, at, at that for a moment. We're going to learn some things about salt today. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 13 through 16. He says, you are what? The salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? I like this. I'm just going to keep reading. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. He says, but you are what? The light of the world. Can you say that? Let's say it together. Just repeat after me. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. And then I love this. We all should know this one by heart, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glory your Father in heaven. See, as we think about salt, as you know, it purifies, doesn't it? Salt purifies. What do you mean by that? It adds flavor to bland food and helps preserve meat. As we think about the Bible time, salt was more valuable, right, than even money was. In the ancient Roman, the ancient Romans used to give their soldiers, they used to pay them with salt rather than money. As you think about the word salary comes to us from the Roman word, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce this, pronounce this uh, salarum, which speaks of a soldier being paid in salt. The phrase, not worth his salt, have you ever heard that phrase? He's not worth his salt, comes from this practice. And yet when Jesus called his people the salt of the earth, his people, you, me, we are the salt of the earth. And he uses it as a metaphor that teaches about the influence his people are to have in the world today. Our preserving influence, as you think about salt, it prevents from what? Rot or decay. It is, it is rubbed into meat, right? In an effort to preserve it. As you think about Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19, they could have been saved by the per, uh, perse persevering or preservance uh, influence of just as 
the Lord said what? Ten just men. Finally, just ten just men. And yet at the same time, as we think about the world we live in, right? The world we live in. So it is with us. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It is the righteousness of God's children that made our country what it is today. The righteousness. And it, will, it is also what keeps this country from being judged today, I believe. Our penetrating influence, salt will penetrate whatever it touches. It is an aggressive substance. As you think about the early church in the book of Acts, chapter 8, Verse, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 8, verse 17. It says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world what? Upside down have come here too. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 talks about when Saul came against the church. I believe that we have been called by the Lord to be an active force in the world around us. And you know that. Because you're going to be challenged here every week. Week after week. Just when you thought it was over. <laughs> here it is again. The church should be an army charging the very gates of hell as the Bible would say in Matthew 16 Verse 18. It says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Shake the gates of hell. We have a purifying influence, don't we? We should. We have a purifying influence. <coughs> Salt has remarkable cleansing ability. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, you don't need to turn there for sake of time, but Elisha cleansed the water at Jericho with what? Salt. In the ancient times, newborn babies were washed in salt to cleanse their bodies and to give the firmness to their skin. And salt in a wound can what? Hurt. <laughs> it can hurt, but it can cleanse the area. It can cleanse the area. Often Christians have a purifying effect on the wounds around them. We ought to behave differently when the child of God walks up. Right? We should be that. As others are watching our life, have you ever came into a conversation all of a sudden people change their tone? <clears throat> You're going to get a cup of coffee? Did I interrupt something? <laughs> Don't be offended if they stop or acting as you know or they stop talking to you right or they stop inviting you praise the Lord don't be affirmed, uh, offended so you may say but I have no more family then well yes you do look around you so guess what you need to start getting to know each other that's just what it comes down to but, but they're not my family yes they are in Christ we're brothers and sisters in the Lord amen amen I was very blessed this last week. I was very blessed. We were invited over to a family's house in the church. Actually, I've been blessed last. Man, I've been blessed all year. <laughs> I've been eating at your homes all year long, me and my wife. It's been good stuff. Some of y'all are still waiting. But <laughs> Gotta get ready for next year. <clears throat> Ricardo Kim. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was bad. <laughs> you know, I love you guys. <laughs> but last week we got invited to a uh, family's house, and I loved it because they didn't just invite us, they invited like, I don't know, some of you know, you were invited, like 50, it was like, a, like 75 of us, and I was thinking, man, they had tables, they rented tables and chairs, and they had, they, what they did was they, they said, you know, uh, and the husband, he says, you are our family. And so we wanted to have you guys over for early Thanksgiving because we're going to be going, they're going to be going to uh, Vegas to visit their family. And they said, um, you are our family. And we're just glad to have you here with us. And they took their whole day literally to prepare this f meal and people brought food. And it was like, wow, I mean, I didn't have to organize this. Praise the Lord. God is good. The church is growing. People are getting to know each other. And I, I, was, I was exhausted because it was after, after our uh, Sunday service, it was after our meeting. And, but at the same time, I was very glad that I went because I got to see our church and our young families interact with each other. And I'm like, wow, this is, the church is, is, is really coming together. Really coming together because that's really what church, that's what we are. We're family. And we did communion together, and he did communion for the first time. And I was very blessed to see that maturity in his life as a father. And just, man, I was ministered to big time. But so, don't be sad if the holidays are coming and you feel, I don't have family. Because sometimes this is the most depressing time of the year for a lot of people. A lot of, they have some of the highest suicide rates during this time. That's why we want to give Christmas away. We want to look for those that may not have families. And we want to say, hey, we have a little, come on. You can come eat with us. Every year we have multiple families with us that the Lord will impress on our heart just to have dinner with us. But remember, you are the purifying force in the world around you today. And as we think about Leviticus 2.13, every meat offering was to be made with salt. So it is with our lives. We are to offer our life as an offering to the Lord. Did you know that? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Bible reminds us, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be what? <coughs> Conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so when we do it, it proves that we are worth our salt. See, our, our pleasing influence brings out the best salt blends. And we all know that, right? Because we all love our foods, right? You think about your food without salt, right? Flavors to food. In fact, there are so many foods that are better, right? With salt than without salt. So too, the Christian should flavor the world around them with what? With salt. To be that salt. As salt, we are to live our lives to bring what? To bring out the best in those around us. You ever thought about it that way? Because you take a piece of meat, you add salt to it, and what does it do? It brings out the flavors in that piece of meat or in that chicken or whatever it is you're putting, that, putting it in. Those, 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 those smashed beans with a little bit of salt and some cheese on it. And it's right. <laughs> but what are we doing in people's lives? Are we bringing out the best in people's lives? My prayer is, Lord, are you better for coming to this church? That's my prayer. And, I, and that's my, my goal. And that's what I'm called to do, is bring out the best. You see, because as I, as I, as I hang out with you guys, I see that you guys have certain, uh, dis, dis, I wouldn't say disabilities, but certain things that you, you think about yourself that you cannot do. You're, you're teenagers. They, they think, oh, I can't do it. When we think about the high schools and the Christian clubs, a lot of them are, oh, no, I can't do it. It's, it's, it's too big. It's, you know, it's too much. It's like, no, you can do it. You can do it. You got everything it takes to do it. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you and works through you. Every single one of us can do it. Amen? Amen. And so, 
Again, as Christians, we should add that flavor and make it a better place. And that is what Jesus did time and time again, didn't He? Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. It says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, or am absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for what? For the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your advers uh, adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, that from God, for to you it has been granted on, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Amen. And so... We also need to have not only a purifying influence, but we also need to have somewhat of a poisoning influence. What are you saying? What do you mean? Well, what does salt do? Salt kills some things. Even pour... Have you ever poured salt on a slug? <laughs> I, I remember as a child, not me, but my son, at our home church in Chino Valley... Uh, I think Kimmy knows. Kimmy remembers. So she's the one who pointed it out. She used to watch our kid, and and our, and, and uh, our kids. Just our son used to love snails, and he would just go out in pockets full of snails. And my wife would watch his little bit, you know, his little pants and the snails all up in the pockets. Poor snails. But you all know, right? I mean, I'm sure everybody has gotten a snail and thrown a little bit of salt on it. Right? Poor snail. Oh, yeah. It just does not mix. Salt poured on a lawn will kill grass. And too much salt is not good for your blood pressure, right? Too much, and as we look at Abimelech, right, in Judges 9.45, he took a city and he sold in that city, he sold it with salt to prevent the ground from being used to grow crops, so he killed the field with his salt. By the same token, when true Christianity is sold into the lives, homes, and communities in the world, also what happens, we get to put some things to death in our own lives. Because some, some things in our life have to die. Don't they? They have to die. There's some habits that we have that need to die. They're like snails. And we need to just throw some salt on it. We can make an impact in our world by the very fact that Christianity is pure poison to sin. When Jesus comes into a life, guess what? Drinking, Cursing, fighting, hating, killing, drug abuse, loose living, immorality, all those things should be put to death as we yield to Him in sanctification, as we yield to Him in purification. We see a great example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what is he? A new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold what? All things have become new. Salt also creates a thirst. A thirst for water. Doesn't it? A thirst for water in those who are exposed to it. What do you mean? As salt, the Christians, has, we have the wonderful opportunity to promote a thirst for Jesus in the world. I'm thirsty. Why? Wow, the world is thirsty. There's a drought. And we get, to, we get to be what? That overflowing. As Jesus overflows through our life, people are going, let me drink. I need a drink. Remember what the Lord told us in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. He says, in the last days, the great days of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if any man what? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow what? 
Rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. When we live as Christians should, when we take the call of Jesus Christ seriously and live right, look right, act right, talk right, live right, then we have the ability to create a thirst, right? A thirst for Jesus in the hearts of those around us. When that happens, then we can point the men or the sisters to Jesus and we share with them the water of life and we give to them the water of life. We, had, we were at Abby Miller on Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday we were at Abby Miller. And brothers, we just started going there to encourage the Christian club, to get that Christian club going. Simply just teach the Christian club how to run a Christian club. And, and you know, it's amazing the impact that God has given to us there. People are thirsty, guys. Our kids are thirsty. So we're on the campus. So after we do the Christian club, which are the two lunches, before we even get there, I run into the athletic director, I run into the principal, and it's like, it's like, right, we're just chit-chatting, man. I mean, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Glad you're here. I mean, the principal. I'm like, I'm like wow. God is opening doors for us. So we're, we're walking, and we have the athletic director, one of the security guards says, hey, we need you guys. We have a situation for you. So there was a gentleman they were talking to. He was a young man, 15 years old. He just got relocated to this house on Citrus, and he just got out of juvenile hall. So he's there, and he don't want to be there. He's angry. It's the first day of school. I don't want to be here. I'm angry. I don't want to be here. We talked to him, talked to him. We took uh, a gentleman with us by the name of Dave. He, has a, uh, he also graduated from Abbey Miller, has a rough background in, in gangs and, and, and what have you. And he was able to share with this guy. Come to find out this gentleman, 15 years old, had a son already. Had a son already, been in and out of juvenile halls. And we got to talk to him, we got to witness to him. And the reality, you know, we talked to him about Jesus, asked him if he ever accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He says no. We asked him if he would like to. He said yes. So here we are. <laughs> During school hours, the public school, encouraged by the athletic director, by these, we're praying, all four of us in this circle, as the bell's ringing, kids are walking, and this kid is accepting Jesus Christ on school campus. <laughs> Amen. After we get the opportunity to go to ALC, y'all know ALC? All, what is it, Alternative Learning? What is it, Senator? Y'all have been there before, huh? <laughs> well, they had their ALC again, went in there, and Dave, Dave, man, that brother just got used to him that day, and he shared his testimony, and like a lot of those kids in ALC. And it was a blessing because we were preaching the gospel, straight out, preaching straight gospel message. You need Jesus, you need to repent, and you can do that right now in the classroom. And then all, like, most of the kids accepted the Lord. And then the teacher chimed in and said, now that you receive Jesus, you better not be late to class. <laughs> you better do your homework. And it was like, I mean, these, these kids had nowhere to run. But the reality is, I mean, it was neat to just be a part of that. And you, and you just, you leave and you're just like, what, what, what just happened? Right? But the reality is, guys, when you make yourself available, right, God will use you. People are thirsty. And we can be that living water. We can bring them that living water. You see, as we think about Tula and Jair, you know, they carried out a very important ministry in Israel. God used them to, to touch a nation. God used them to maintain peace. God used them for His glory. And that is the mark of success in ministry. My prayer is that we will honor God throughout the days of our lives. Throughout the days of our lives. When we think about the message that they preached, you think about, they were for 45 years, God used them there. They did not lead armies. They did not build cities. They did not write books, right? They did not, what they did was far more important. These men stood for God in evil days. They stood for righteousness in evil days. They may not have had individuals ask for their autograph, but their lives through little, 
is recorded about them still preach to us today. Amen? And some lessons we can learn from these unknown men, right? There is a lesson in their names, but for sake of time, we're going to go ahead and skip all that, and we're going to get right into the conclusion. When we think about Jair, God raised him up to bring peace to the nation. God raised up Jesus to do what? To bring peace to our souls and to reconcile us back to the Lord. Jire had sons who were ambassadors of peace. Think about Jire for you fathers, right? They were ambassadors of peace to the nation of Israel. Jesus has children. We are his children. We are to be what? His ambassadors of peace, of salvation to the entire world. When you think about his sons, they all had their own little, what, towns. They all had their own little donkeys. I mean, his father left them in inheritance. His father left them and, and taught them very well that they would go on and leave a better legacy than even his father's. So, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, It says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Ephesians 4.13, it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, what is his goal? God's goal is to make you and to make me more like his son, Jesus Christ. He will give you the grace to stand in hard times. He will give you what you need to go through whatever you go through in life, whatever he's called, to, called you in life. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, my grace is what? Sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may what? Rest upon me. You see, the Lord will give you the grace to thrive in the midst of hardship, to thrive in the midst of difficulty. You see, God is honored and He will honor our lives as He honored the life of uh, Tula and Jire. Did not accomplish anything that stands out, but He honored them. And so, in closing, I want to end with this. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, tonight to keep living for the Lord. Amen? Amen. To keep living for the Lord. The Bible says, Moreover, it is required in stewardship that one be what? One be found faithful. Be faithful to God in the least. In the everyday menial tasks that He gives you to do. From waking up in the morning to going to work, doing the right thing throughout the whole day. Keep living for Him, even when times are tough. Keep living for Him, even when others fall away. Keep living for Him, even when you are attacked for it, persecuted for it. Keep living for the Lord, even when you are not popular for doing it, when it's unpopular. Keep living for Him when others walk away. And at the end of life, at the end of a life of faithfulness, of what? Consistent love for the Lord. You will hear these words in Matthew 25, verse 21. All, all of those words that all of us should desire to hear. Where he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will what? Make you rulers over many things. Enter into what? The joy of the Lord. You see, those words from our Lord will make every mile, every hardship, every difficulty, every difficult experience, every rejected experience in this world worthwhile. Every sense of ounce of pain, every tear that may have been shed will make it worthwhile. And I want to encourage you, man, whether that comes today for me or tomorrow, <laughs> 
Praise the Lord. I fought the good fight. I finished well, right? You see, Tula and Jair lived and they died in obscurity, but their lives continue to speak to us about their own walks with the Lord. Their lives were not in vain. I want to encourage you, no matter what your past is, no matter what you've done, right, your life is not in vain. Your life is not in vain. You know, you matter to God. Do you know that? You may not matter to, to your spouse sometimes. Or, you know, you may feel like, like, just, you want to fly away because we mess up sometimes. Listen, you matter to God. Amen? Can you say that? I matter to God. That's all that matters. Right? You matter to your family. Can you say that? I matter to my family. Do you can you can you say this? Because as your pastor, every single one of you matter to this church. I matter to this church. Without you, we're not the same. You, we're not. You all bring something. It's kind of like a potluck, right? You all bring something to the table. And without that dish, we miss out. And when you miss when, when you miss church, when you miss service, guess what? We miss out on you being here. When you take a, a sabbatical or whatever you however you say it, if I said that right, you just want to take a nap from God. We miss you. We go find out where you live and blow the trumpet. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Stay on course, guys. Stay on course. There is a payday. Amen? No matter how hard it is, there is a payday. One day, you will reach the end of your earthly journey in this world. And it might be tonight. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. I was reminded of that. As my daughter shared with me stories that she went to visit a morgue today. You would say, why is your daughter visiting morgues? You know what? I would encourage all of you to go visit a morgue. You may appreciate the life that God's given you. You may appreciate the family that God's given you just a little bit more knowing that we're only one bad step off a little curve we can break our neck. And, and or anybody else in our family and then we're going to miss them. And we're going to live with certain things that we regret because we didn't yield to the Spirit of God. Whether it was telling about Jesus or whether it was telling sorry. Are there needs in your life tonight? Are there, need, there are needs in your life that should be addressed tonight? Are you faithful? Are you consistent in your walk with the Lord? Do you need to come before Him and say some, something to the Lord tonight? Well, we're going to pray. If you can have the worship team come, come on up. We're going to pray. And if, if, if you are... If you're struggling with something here tonight, if there's some, some issues you need to address to the Lord tonight, we want to do that before you leave. We want to do that before you leave. We don't know what awaits us out in this world. It's kind of like the ocean. Y'all think you're safe. All of a sudden, we're gone. Life's about a vapor, the Bible says. And you know what? Man, that should make us appreciate every single one of us. Huh? The person you sit next to, like, you may not know them very well, but man, they can go home tomorrow, praise God. But we got to appreciate each other. We got to enjoy each other's company. We got to be the church and love on each other. We got to be, you know, like the Lord says, what? By this, they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, hanging out with these kids in high school, man, hanging out with these kids in the flip, it's amazing because you forget how, how fleshy this world is. What'd you say? What'd you say? What, you want some of me? You want some of me? It's like... <laughs> and you forget sometimes as a pastor what people struggle with. But I know we all struggle. Guys, we got to be better. Amen? And I say this, right? Don't be bitter, be better. 
Listen, we don't need to stand up to any man, but we do need to stand for Christ. And it takes a real man to stand up for Christ. Any, any man can fight. We all have that ability. Any man can get angry. Anybody can yell and scream and do all that stuff. But what about go out and represent Christ? What about go out and be the light of the world? What about, what about go out and shine when everybody else is living in, a, in darkness? What about instead of going downstream like all the dead fish flow, everybody else is doing it, what about making that struggle uphill, upstream? Kind of like that little train, right? I think I can. I think I can. Some of us are, are, are facing an uphill battle right now. With Christ, we can do all things. Maybe you just need to plug back into the Lord tonight. I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to pray for you. And if you want to get plugged back into the Lord, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I would encourage you, beg of you, to make sure you, you receive Him tonight. Because we don't know where tomorrow holds to us. And if you don't believe me, go visit the morgue. Amen. People die every day by the thousands. Father, we thank you for this great opportunity, Lord, to look at these two men's life, Father, and just see how they brought peace. See how they lived for righteousness. See how they, Lord, were able to, for, for close to 50 years, Lord, honor you and glorify you, Lord. And Father, even as we live in a world where, Father, you have called us to be salt and light. You have called us, Lord, to be set apart. You have called us to bring, to bring peace, Lord, into this world. And Father, we know that peace comes through you, Lord, the Prince of Peace. The Lord of Lords. And even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed. Maybe you're here today and again, there are certain things that need to be addressed in your life. You need to pour the salt on that sin of your life. It needs to die. You need to get rid of it because it's eating you up. You need to pour that spiritual salt on it right now. Have you been faithful to the Lord? Have you been faithful in your walk to God? Is God calling you back to take that step? At one time, you were walking with him, you were in the garden with him, and you were spending time with him, and now you feel so far away from God. Listen, he never left you. And even as we think about the prodigal son, right? His father looked for him every day in anticipation. And when he saw his son, he ran to meet him. Listen, God is here to meet you today. He's been waiting, he's been looking, he's been sending laborers out to speak to you. You're here today, and God wants to meet you, and he wants to make it right. If that's you today, I'd ask that you would just raise your hand right where you're at. We can pray for you right where you're at. Whether it's a recommitment or whether it's a first-time dedication, you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you would just raise your hand. So Father, we do thank you just for a place that we can come and we can read your word and we can continue to grow in you. I want to take this moment and I'm going to ask that as a church, you just repeat after me. Lord, it doesn't matter who knows me as long as they can see you. It doesn't matter where I am as long as you have placed me there. It doesn't matter what is happening to me. As long as you control it. It doesn't matter to me what I accomplish in life. As long as I have accomplished everything you have saved me for. In the name of Jesus, all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Let's go to the Lord.